Hey there, School of Tomorrow viewers. This is a shorter video. The last one was almost 20 minutes, like 17 minutes. And I maybe brought up more questions than I answered. Two of those questions, what is star map again, and why did I call it star map? Well, I didn't call it star map. It comes that way in the Python standard library. So I'm going to explain that a little bit. And another question you might have had, and I'm not going to go too deeply into it, because <clears throat> I want to keep this short mainly, is what's the connection between Alan Turing and why he <clears throat> why he was owed an apology by the British government? What did they do to Alan Turing that we now regard as... <clears throat> not very civilized, right? And does the lambda calculus, which I'm saying could have to do with cryptography, have anything to do with the use of the letter lambda as what we call an LGBT symbol, according to Wikipedia? And I bring this up for another reason, cryptography. There's what we could call encoding of information that is not designed to hide the meaning, it's designed to convey the meaning, but if you haven't learned the language, it seems like it might as well be a secret code. But it's not like people are trying to hide the meaning. It's more like you don't have time to learn the meaning. And a lot of <clears throat> what, what scares people about other cultures is they feel overwhelmed by what it would take to become fluent. And that can be with regard to a computer language, a human language, or what I'll call more like a para-language, P-A-R-A. It's a human language, but it's a subset of a language, <clears throat> and it focuses on symbols. And the military is full. I don't, When I say the military, I mean like the world military, is full of coding regarding rank, regarding uh, honor, uh, respect, uh, you know, like purple hearts and, you know, awards. So the whole idea of identity, who I am relative to other people and so on, we, we encode that. Some people say wear it on our sleeve. Well, that's if you actually put a bunch of codes on your lapel or whatever, you know, a lot of people want you to know about them, and so they put all the codes that you might need uh, on their clothing even. But if you can't read that code, well, you know, do you have time to learn it? And I'm, I'm asking that as an open question. I would say the answer is not in every case, because there are just too many cultures and codes out there, but which ones do you need for fluency, right, in your own environment? Now here in Oregon, as a Quaker of the unprogrammed variety, we have what's called same-sex marriage. <clears throat> Not a big deal anymore, but it was at one time. And I do go through in my blogs some of these gender bender, you could say, issues that we we confront here in Portland as much as anywhere. And um, this is what I don't want to go into in great detail, but I just want to say that there is a long tradition in theater of regardless of your gender or your sex, you're going to be able to play characters of any other gender. Like, you're not limited, you're not typecast when it comes to playing a role you don't necessarily have to stick to the same gender or sex. And I'm for now going to use those two almost interchangeably, which is already a problem for a lot of people. But we're in the namespace area of namespaces where, you know, people do speak in different ways. And the pronouns, that's a big deal, right? Applewhite, my friend Applewhite, he was into pronouns and how they're used in synergetics, actually. He, him, I, we... This is not only about gender, right? It's when you say, we have nuclear weapons. And I can sort of look you in the eye and I can say, I'm skeptical. I don't think you have any nuclear weapons. And I could say that to just about anyone. I don't really know anyone who has nuclear weapons. 
But then there are a lot of people who feel they do, at least. It's like they can swagger about more and they can sort of be bossy because they know they have nuclear weapons. So I can sort of pick out in a crowd people who think they have nuclear weapons. They have a kind of a different code of conduct. And so they encode their knowing that they have nuclear weapons as kind of like um, a symbol, right? A behavior pattern, a certain walk and talk. Oh, that people thinks they have nuclear weapons, right? So this idea that you can brand yourself and code yourself and have an identity, that's not a new idea. The idea that you might transgress certain gender boundaries in the character you play, like you obviously don't look female, yet you're playing a female character and vice versa, things like that. That happens in Portland some. And maybe tourists get a little bit upset about it. And it can be awkward because you don't know when you meet somebody necessarily what they play, what their character is. There's no immediate knowledge of that. And a lot of social interactions are casual and depend on immediate impressions. And you don't like to be wrong a lot and, you know, feel like you're in trouble. So there's a lot to negotiate. And that's kind of how urban living is. We have a dense, a dense population, a high frequency of communication, and therefore more chance to like work through all these codes of conduct and so on. And people in slower moving cultures that aren't like computing at such a high rate, they may um, feel alienated by the city, city people and how fast they evolve all these new subcultures and it seems just like another planet in some ways. The urban-rural divide can be real. But I'm simplifying quite a bit because in the rural, in the rural areas we always have seeds for new um, new growth sometimes, like population shift around is what I'm saying. So I can't speak for rural populations really, or urban populations. I'm, I'm trafficking, trafficking in stereotypes here. I acknowledge it. So let's finish up with running this particular uh, code here. Notice that I'm importing star map again. I checked its type. It's actually type type. I thought it might be a generator, and it does respond to next. So if I just cut and paste this particular uh, line of code to the uh, interactive window here, we'll see it work. I've run this already a couple times, so all the globals that you see, such as args, already have uh, reality over here on the right side. So it knows what args is. It's the same as you see on the left here. And actually the three pairs of arguments, it's easy to tell where the random number came from because these ranges are so different. In one case, any number from 1 to 100, inclusive. In the next one, you got to be negative, up to and including 0, down to negative 10. And in the third, you have to be between 1,000 and 2,000. So these are very distinguishable ranges, right, or domains. So when I run this thing and get my random numbers, we can see clearly where they came from. But it comes back as an object, right? If I actually want to see what's in there, I better convert it to something like a tuple or a list. And this thing can be exhausted. Actually, I'll show you that. I can go next on it. So it behaves like a generator. I have other Python videos about the generator types. So next works. Again, there's from the negative range, right, over here. And then <clears throat> finally, now what's going to happen next? No pun intended, or pun intended, it's going to what? <clears throat> going to raise a, <clears throat> raise a stop iteration, isn't it? In other words, we've come to the end of the rope, end of the train tracks, nowhere else to go. If I go next, there's nowhere else to go except raise a stop iteration. Now that, <clears throat> that very exception 
is what tells a for loop to quit. In other words, when I loop around in this for loop 17, 18, having created exactly that same object, it's going to do this basically. The, um, the for loop's job is to basically hit the target with next, 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 until stop iteration is raised. But instead of making a fuss, it eats that and just gracefully exits the for loop. That's how Python triggers exiting for loops. Turn your target into an iterator, and iterators raise stop iteration at the end of the line. Now you may have the kind of iterator that never does come to the end of the line, in which case your for loop had better have some other way to exit, right? Get out. Otherwise you're stuck in an infinite loop. All prime numbers or something. All digits of pi <clears throat> could go on for years. So of course we need a way to uh, escape such a for loop, but in this case it's a very finite loop and we're out of it in no time. So when I run this whole thing, you see what happens on the right. I just get my uh, random numbers three times, or twice, all three of them twice. Now why do I do it twice? Well what I'm separating here with the dotted uh, line is the second for loop where I just take my args individually. In other words, I'm going to loop over the arguments defined in line 12. They didn't go anywhere. They're still there. They're not exhausted. Just because I printed out these results didn't have any effect on args. It's kind of a read-only constant. So I'm going to loop over it again, and this time I'm going to pick out each pair as I go. But remember, a tuple no matter how many elements it has, is a single object. It has elements inside of it, but it is individually an object. So it's not going to work to feed it to lambda AB down here, and here's how Python uses lambda. It's pretty much a one-liner is all you can do, where you put the arguments you expect on the left as if you're defining a function, which you are, a callable, and then put a one-liner here. You can try getting fancy with a semicolon or something. I don't recommend it. Let's put a nice little one-liner. It could be another lambda expression in here. You can get pretty fancy. But for now, all it's doing is what we've seen above. It's creating a random integer between A and B. But if we just pass a tuple, as you see here, 1, 100, that's going to be a problem because it expects two arguments, A and B. So how do we split 1 and 100 apart and really turn that into two arguments? Well, that's what the star does. It blows it apart, blows each of these tuples apart into separate arguments, and that means the whole expression works fine, and that's why star map is called star map, because it's behaving like you were putting a star in front, right? In other words, it goes through what it's mapping to, args, and it like a, applies a star in front of each of these tuples. Implicitly, we can imagine it doing that. That's how it behaves. And that's why it's called star map. Okay, you're learning some Python that some, even some experienced programmers might not know, because they don't have the habit of going into iter tools or whatever. There's a lot of I'd call it um, high Python, we could say, which is also Pythonic Python, that if you stick around and learn from this school of tomorrow, you will get more of it than some channels, just to be a little bit competitive. All right, talk to you soon.